So we talked in the math camp a little bit about uh, generalization and consistency as being sort of the primary theoretical concepts people use to think about the accuracy of a learning algorithm. Um, and as a reminder, uh, these concepts are based on the relationship between the empirical accuracy of your learning algorithm on a particular training set, the expect expected accuracy of your learning algorithm, uh, and the expected accuracy of the best possible uh, hypothesis in your hypothesis class. So um, the expected accuracy, if we're going to use f sub s to be the function that's learned on a training set s, uh, the expected accuracy with respect to a loss v is given by this. Um, and the integral is over the uh, points at which you're evaluating z. And z is a pair of an input uh, point and an output label. OK, so this is the expected accuracy of the learning algorithm. And then the empirical accuracy, we'll say, is i sub s. And this is just the empirical mean of the loss of the learned function at the points in the training set. Which one is yeah, the black one was running out. I can give it a shot. You let me know. Uh. Yeah, I think this is running low. Yep. Uh, yeah, sure, we can write it. I'm being a little casual here. So, um, yeah, you would write a little bit more formally, you would write this with the measure, the probability measure, let's call it mu. And this is going to give the probability of each point z. So, yeah. Um, sorry, let's try the black one. OK. Z, Z is the pair, actually, like here. Pair. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's the joint distribution of input, uh, input point and out output label. OK. Um, so we have the empirical mean the uh, expected accuracy, and then, um, all right, and generalization is, generalization is a statement about the relationship between the empirical accuracy of your algorithm and its expected accuracy. And so it's saying that the difference between the empirical accuracy and the expected accuracy is small. Okay. And we're going to use generalization. When you can prove generalization for an algorithm, it means that you can go ahead and prove things about the expected accuracy, um, which is much easier to characterize than the empirical accuracy, all right? And so you prove things about the expected accuracy, and then because this is close to this, then um, the things that you proved about the expected accuracy carry over to the empirical accuracy. Um, let's see. Now, consistency is a little bit closer to what you would think of as sort of the success of your learning algorithm. Um, and consistency is saying that the expected accuracy 
of your learned function is close to the expected accuracy of the best possible function in the given hypothesis class. OK, so this is a little bit more like uh, saying, you know, how close to optimal um, in terms of prediction accuracy is your learning algorithm. So we're not going to be talking very much about consistency. The main, um, the main focus is going to be on generalization. Uh, and when you do show consistency, normally what you're doing is you're showing first generalization And then once you know your empirical accuracy is close to the expected, then you show that the expected accuracy is close to the best possible. And this is sort of a, a full characterization of the learning algorithm. OK. OK. So forgetting then about consistency, The key thing that we want to show, then, to show that the learning algorithm generalizes is that this quantity is small. And this, we're going to call the defect. OK. Yep. Oh, awesome. So this is where maybe you've heard a, a generalization bound. Um, that's a synonym for a defect bound, which is going to be a bound for a fixed size of your training set on the size of this deviation here. Now, uh, a primary concern then is to show is to establish what are going to be sufficient conditions uh, that you're, you can show that your learning algorithm um, satisfies these conditions and therefore those conditions are sufficient for generalization. Um, and historically, uh, those conditions were things like the VC dimension um, and Rademacher complexity, covering numbers, things like this, that were conditions on, sort of directly on the hypothesis space, showing how large, in some sense, the hypothesis space is. If it's small, then the generalization bound is going to be small as well. Um, I hope I'm getting that correct. OK. So as of around 2003, um, some people, including uh, Tommy and others in the lab, uh, established a different sort of sufficient condition for generalization um, that's based on a concept from uh, sensitivity analysis which is um, in control theory and some other engineering applications, when you want to know how stable, if you have the solution to an optimization problem and you want to know how stable is that solution under uh, perturbation of the inputs, um, and so how sensitive is it, uh, then there are tools for showing that you know, different kinds of, of problems have different, um, will change varying amounts under perturbation. Uh, so the condition that they established is that when you have, when the learning problem is stable, then that is sufficient for generalization of the, the learning algorithm, okay? Uh, and we're going to go into uh, detail on that one. So, let's see. OK. So in the learning context, stability is roughly just that the learned function doesn't change much
when you change the training set just a little bit. Now in class, so today what we're going to show is um, a stronger version of this called uniform stability. Uh, and so uniform stability, um, so going back just a second, so what we've shown is that the stability condition is actually necessary and sufficient for generalization. Uniform stability is not necessary, it's a stronger condition. You need not be uniformly stable in order for the algorithm to generalize. Um, but that's what we're going to focus on today. Uh, so we're going to, well, okay, I'll just define uniform stability. <coughs> All right. So we're going to have the learning algorithm and we're going to, to say that it's beta stable. And beta is going to be sort of our stability parameter. Um, and the statement is this. So for all, so we're going to have the training set S and we're going to have this additional point Z and legible. So, um, so what we're bounding here is the, the difference between the loss at a point z prime uh, for the, the function that was learned on the training set s. <coughs> the deviation between that loss and the loss for the function that was trained on f where you replaced the i point in the training set with some point z that we're spec specifying here, OK? And so no matter what z is, no matter what s is, when I go ahead and replace one point in the training set, the deviation, the change in the loss is going to be less than or equal to beta. So that's what it means to be beta stable. I hope that's clear. Um, I don't think I'm familiar enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, something important to notice here um, is that beta is actually a function of n. So, it'd be more accurate to write beta sub n here. So, this bound is going to depend on how large the training set is. Okay. All right. Let's see. Right. Um Right, so beta is uniform over i, but the uniform here re refers to the supremum over z prime. So without, when it, if you were to say it's just stable without the uniform, beta would ac could actually be a function of z prime. Right, yeah. Does that make sense? So here we're saying that this is the supremum over all possible uh, points at which you're evaluating your learned function.
Sorry? Right, so this is actually independent of any distribution. This would be the case. This is for all um, possible training sets and points Z. So th this is not a bound in probability or anything. This is, this is a property of the loss and the learned function. Okay, so yeah, that's right. So it's a soup over. Um, so again, it's the space of these pairs, and I don't know. To be concrete, you can say this is x is in R D, and then y is I don't know zero or one, just for a concrete example. Okay. So we're going to try to show that uniform stability is sufficient for generalization of the learning algorithm. Um, and so next time on Wednesday, actually, we're going to be showing that uniform stability is actually a property of Tikhonov regularization. So this is a way to show that Tikhonov actually generalizes. Yeah. S is the training set. All right, so the, the way that we're going to approach this is via concentration inequalities, um, which is something we talked about a little bit in the math camp. Um, and generally, the concentration inequality comes into play when you want to bound the deviation between an empirical quantity and its expectation. Um, so in our case, uh, well, so let's just go back to the example that we used in the math camp. Um, the empirical quantity was just the uh, empirical mean of a bunch of in IID random variables. And then the expectation is the expectation of the random variable. And uh, the bound that you get on the deviation between the empirical mean of the IID random variables and their expectation is called the weak law of large numbers. Um, and that, let's see. And so, yeah, I won't go much into that. But the, the concentration inequality that we used was Chebyshev's inequality. Um, and... Okay. Now today, the uh, let's see here. The empirical quantity that we're going to use is the defect. And then we're going to bound. its deviation from its expectation. And we can't actually use Chebyshev or the weak law of large numbers here. Um, so the weak law of large numbers depends on the fact that these random variables are IID. And we don't actually have IID random variables here. So just writing out the defects.
so fundamentally what's random here, the random quantity is um, the points in the training set, okay? And from that you get a random function that's learned by the algorithm on that training set. And that becomes another random variable here, which is the loss of that learned function at any particular point. Okay, that's a random variable. And so from that, you get, you know, this is the empirical mean of these random variables, which are the loss. Okay? Now, these are not actually independent, which is the reason that we can't use the weak large, large numbers. And the reason that they're not independent is because the learned function depends on the entire training set. Okay? We can go ahead and assume that the, the points are being sampled IID. But regardless, the function that you learn depends on all of them, so the loss at any particular point is not independent. Yeah. So the sample mean in, in this case would be this entire quantity here. It's because it's, you have that loss in there. It's because of the loss. Well, it's, I mean, it's because of the learning algorithm itself. Um, yeah, because it's not a mean over training sets, okay. plural, it's a single training set. So we want to bound this, and we can't use uh, the weak law of large numbers. And the concentration inequality that we're going to use then is a little bit more general, and it's called McDermott's inequality. And the requirements for that are you have a sequence of random variables again. Um, they are, let's see, interesting. Okay. They are independent. But whereas before we were evaluating the sample mean of these random variables, which is a linear function of them, you can have an arbitrary nonlinear function now of the random variables. And it's a, we'll say it's a functional, meaning it's mapping these random variables into just a scalar value in R. Okay. And the only other requirement that we need is that the expected value, the expectation of any one of these is finite. Let's see. Sorry. The expectation, this is the expectation of F evaluated at your random variables is finite. Okay. So if you have f and a set of random variables that satisfy these, um, then there's one more condition. And this is going to be the one sort of uh, where a lot of the work is going to go. So Has two for all out there. Um, yep. So you said that you couldn't use the weak law of large numbers yep. because the uh, value, the values of the log function in 
for not independent or not against the British Indian? They're not independent. Yeah, so I'll get there in a second. Basically, the random variables that are the inputs to make the arguments are going to be the independently sampled training set points. And we're going to use the fact that f is uh, potentially nonlinear. It's an arbitrary functional to go ahead and encompass all of the non-independent, like the loss in the learning algorithm. Okay, so if you can satisfy these conditions, um, this last condition is saying that if I go ahead and uh, replace the ith value uh, in my sequence of realizations of this random variable, these random variables, if I replace the ith value, then the amount by which f changes is bounded. Okay, which looks a lot like it's a stability condition. Okay. Okay, so if you satisfy these, then what McDermott's gives you is that the deviation of f from its expectation is bounded in probability. Oops. Okay, so if you satisfy these conditions, then this is true, that the probability that f's value deviates from its expectation by more than epsilon is bounded by this exponential. Okay, so the way that we apply this then, our random variables are Our random variables are going to be the zi's. Which we already just assumed are iid. Okay, so we satisfy condition one. Um, now we define the functional then It's going to be a function of, again, the sequence of points, which is just the training set. And that is going to be the defect. OK. All right, so when we define that, then the second condition that we show is that the expectation of this, the expectation of the defect is finite. And the last one is the most important one, and that's showing that this condition is satisfied, um, which is saying So condition one we get automatically by assumption. Condition two um, is going to be relatively quick. Um, and basically, we're going to do it by another assumption. Um, so to show that the expected value of the defect, uh, let's see. Is 
is finite. We're going to suppose that the loss is bounded. And this is actually a fairly common assumption that people make. Um, and it may or may not seem natural. So like, for example, the least square, the, the square loss is not bounded on the reals. And the explanation for why this might be a reasonable assumption is that usually you would be assuming that you, you're, instead of having the entire entirety of RD being your input space, you'd have some compact subset. Okay, you'd say that the input space is bounded. And in that case, yeah, the square loss is bounded. Um, I don't know. Yeah? The CI is the quantity in the bound here. It's just going to be a, a scalar value. Yeah. So that's our goal is to show that there exists some CI. Yeah. Yep. Even even if your you know your um, distribution is compact and supported, as long as it the probability falls off reasonably quickly, the expectation of the square loss is still bounded on that. Right? Um, you don't actually need the function to be bound on That may be true, yeah. That may be true. Yep. Okay. All right. So we basically suppose by assumption. So V is bounded, and then from that, uh, because I don't even I don't think I'll even write it. So the empirical mean of V it will also be bounded as will be the expectation of V. And from that, directly from the definition, this is true. Okay. So the real meat of this then is in that third assumption showing the stability of this functional, which is the defect. It's going to be the stability of the defect to perturbation of the training set at a single point. Um, okay. All right, so let's see. Here is. So there's so we're going to prove two things and then use those. Let me see here. Actually, maybe I'll do it in reverse. So. Um, Now let's see this one. Okay, so we're going to prove two things. Um, the first one. Okay, so let's prove that. Or let's call it stability of the defect. We'll start by just writing these out the definitions of these, and then we can rearrange the terms.
This is just writing out the definitions of the defect. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, combine these two expectations and the two empirical terms. Um, and we'll write. So we split our absolute value into two expressions. This one is the, uh, the these two terms are the expectations, and these are the empirical means. Okay. Let me make sure. Okay. So this expectation, we already know by uh, the assumption of beta stability, we already know how to bound this. So I erased it, but beta stability, if I just write out these a little bit more explicitly. Okay. So uh, beta stability is saying that this loss at any particular point z can't change by more than beta. And therefore, this entire term has to be less than or equal to beta. Okay. And then the second term there, we're going to split into two parts. The first one we're going to, so we replace the ith point in this training set with some other point z. So first we take the loss just at that point, just writing out the definition. So this is just one term from this empirical mean. And this term, let's see, right. So we can't use the beta stability condition here. And this is really the only term in this entire expression that we can't, for which we can't use beta stability. And the reason is that the loss is being evaluated potentially at two different points. Okay? But we made one other assumption that we can apply here, which is that the loss is bounded. Okay? And so this term we're going to say is less than or equal to, let's say the loss, bound on the loss is M. This is going to be less than or equal to m over n. Okay, and then the remaining terms we have the sum of the points not equal to the ith point. So here again, we can apply the beta stability condition. And this is going to be n minus 1 over n times beta, which we'll just treat as being, we'll say that's less than or equal to beta. And then so the final bound that we can write here is this 
uh, de this perturbation, the stability of the defect is less than or equal to 2 beta plus m over n. Okay. So this is a uniform bound over <coughs> z on the amount that, going back to McDermott's, the amount that our linear functional, sorry, our potentially nonlinear functional is varying when you vary one of the random variables. And so we can plug in then, now that we've satisfied all of these conditions, McDermott's then gives us uh, a bound on the probability, a prob let's say, a probabilistic bound on the deviation of uh, f from its mean, on the deviation of the defect from its expectation. So what we get is, let's say, I hope people can read that. So we have a bound on the probability of the deviation of the defect from its expectation. And that bound is written entirely ter in terms of three quantities, which are the number of training set points n, the beta stability bound beta, and the bound on the loss m. So what we really care about is a statement saying uh, that if you fix some high probability that you can say that it's sh certain that this quantity will be uh, within epsilon, some epsilon of this quantity. <laughs> and so that's called the confidence form of the bound. Um, and I'll show how to derive that. So what we want is... For some probability delta, what we want to say is is uh, with some high probability, the defect deviates from its ex expectation by some epsilon that is a function of n beta m and that probability. This is the confidence form of our uh, defect bound. And you can derive this from this um, just with some algebra. So let's define delta here to be equal to this bound on the probability. Did I forget? No. Yes. Wow. Just a
Okay. So let's just rearrange the terms so that we get what we want is epsilon on one side of the equation and then everything else on the other side. So taking the natural log, we get statement and then we'll go ahead and rearrange so that epsilon squared is on one side and let's see um, sure. And then our function epsilon then is just taking this square root. It's going to be this n beta plus m times square root 2 ln 2 over delta over n. Okay, so this is epsilon as a function of n beta m n delta. Okay, and this is bounding the deviation, the defect from its expectation. Um, and then we're just one step away then from a bound on the defect itself, which was our goal. So, Now we can write down the defect bound. And we'll just uh, rearrange uh, the terms there. So what we had was, um, well, OK, it should be clear. So if we just rearrange some terms, moving the expectation from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, Then we get this. And then to get the defect bound, then the only thing that we need to do is bound this in terms of n beta m n, I guess, delta. And so that's the last technical piece. Um, So we have the expectation over the training sets, possible training sets of the defect. We're just writing that out. Just applying the definitions. So the key here is that we are going to pull out the expectation from this term out here. And when you do that, you can go ahead and make a swap, which is to replace this by uh, the 
perturb training set. And so this may or may not be obvious when you think about it. So So this is sort of the key step here. And by pulling out this expectation, um, we've made it so that when you make this replacement of the ith point by z, then all you're really doing is relabeling your training set points. OK, you're just saying that the ith point you know, it, the expectation over the training set and the ith point being z is the same as just the expectation over the training set. I hope that makes sense. Yeah? All possible things of that are growing possible. Um, no. So in this case, that thing that we have, like that label, could be like some weird, not really possible thing. So, so if your training set is of size n, then you're taking the expectation over n samples. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So we're just relabeling our points, and therefore you can treat these expectations as being the same. And when that's the case, then, of course, we can go ahead and apply our uh, beta stability condition again. When you replace the i point by z, then the loss only changes by beta <coughs> at most. OK. So then we have So then we get a concrete form for the defect bound. Um, let me make sure I get it right. OK. So this is the generalization bound given the assumption of uniform stability on the learning algorithm then, and that the loss is bounded, then this will be true. Okay. Now, generalization itself is a statement about the limit with n. And what we need is that this defect between the empirical quantity and its expectation is going to zero when you take the limit. And that is going to require a further condition then. So let's say that we can define the convergence rate of beta we define the convergence rate of beta such that this is going to zero with n. And it's sufficient for beta to be going to 0 as fast as uh, 1 over n. So if that's the case, then we have you know, so if beta is going to 0 as fast as 1 over n, then the convergence rate of our defect is going to be 1 over square root n. Okay. Um, and if it's going slower than 1 over n, then I think you have a problem. But 
Okay. Is this clear? Do people have questions about this? Yep. Um, so it's on two things. The expectation is over the training set, which is defining uh, the learn function. Okay. And it's also over this point z at which you're evaluating. Which the third line, okay. Um, so we made this swap. So this statement has to be equal to this statement here. Um, this expectation is over the training set that's for the learning algorithm, um, and also at this point z which is the point at which you're evaluating each of these loss terms. Um, and we said before, the beta stability criterion is saying that the deviation of the loss um, for the learned function on the training set S from the loss for the learned function at training set S where you perturb the ith point, that deviation is bounded by beta. Right, so we have an empirical average of terms that are less than or equal to beta and the expectation over terms that are less than or equal to beta. So this is uniform stability implying generalization. And then I think next class, we are going to go over the stability of Tikhonov regularization. So we're going to show what is the relationship between n and beta for Tikhonov. Um, and hopefully, it will be such that the defect bound goes to 0. OK. Any questions? Or So if it were 1 over root n, then this term here would oh be increasing. Yeah.